So welcome to the very first edition of What Christians Believe podcast and vidcast. Uh, I'm Eman. I'm Dan, Pastor Dan, uh, as, as Emmanuel likes to call me. Yes, Dan, pastor of Oakland's Bible Chapel. And we're going to delve into uh, the, probably the most primary subject you can get into when you talk about what Christians believe. Mm. Christians, at the very least, have to believe in the supernatural realm. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so you can't open a single page of the Bible without being usually being confronted with the existence of the soul, mm -hmm. spirits, mm -hmm. a creator God. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting is most people throughout history have been supernaturalists. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to actually, if you look at the actual number of humans that are strict atheist materialists, mm -hmm. you, you usually find them in a very, very um, unnatural part of the world. So for example, you have to go to Western civilization, upper middle class or higher, yeah, yeah. who have been through a system of university education, mm -hmm. typically. Mm -hmm. So you have to breed them in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. They don't naturally occur. So something like 99 plus percent of humans, human population throughout history has had a remarkably similar uh, view of the world. Mm -hmm. It involves judgment after death, yeah. uh, spirits, good and evil, mm -hmm. Creator, God, gods, or force, mm -hmm. uh, and the human soul. Right. So you, you know you find these tribes in Papua New Guinea that haven't been touched by the Western world in over a thousand years, mm -hmm. and they have a supernatural hierarchical worldview. Mm -hmm. And the question is: Is that a strange, primitive vestige of human belief? That obviously, you know, if I if my atheist friends will say, okay, well. Do you want to go to the shaman for a medical problem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or do you want to go to a modern doctor who's used the scientific method yeah. and refined their view? So do we want to adopt the supernatural worldview of primitive people? Um, or do we want to delve into the best of what we have to offer? And maybe then you have to go to an elite crust of people in the Western realm, in this mm -hmm. case, atheists, mm -hmm. for your spiritual needs. Yeah, I... <laughs> Everything you said, I think lots of people think about all the time. I think the main question to start with, though, for people, especially an atheist, I, like a, so an atheist who really believes in what they say they believe, most people, when you're talking to them, will say there is something else more than physical existence, even if they'd say they don't believe in God. They'll say there's more to life than just, you know, you could ask, do you believe in ghosts? Mm, I think so, right? Nobody's sure, but hey, I'm not saying there aren't. Well, well, that's supernatural, right? You can ask those kinds of, do you think unexplained events happen that are beyond physical control? Like, do you think of, like, is deja vu a real thing? Like, all kinds of things people will accept as true that are beyond the physical realm. That is the, the first question. Is that an unreasonable belief to think that there is more to our existence, more to the natural world than just the natural world. I think most people would say, yes, there is. Mm -hmm. Then the question of what should we go to the shaman or the doctor becomes, you know, more, okay, well, that might depend on what does the shaman believe about the other world? What does the doctor believe about the other what, We can all agree, I think, that there is something more that is not just a part of the natural formation of this world of, you know, um, what is it? The survival of the fittest, natural selection, spring, summer, winter, fall, plants grow, plants die, they go back in the ground, animals are born, they die, they pair. All of that's very real. I, I hope we all agree, can agree on that. I think that most people also understand that there is something more than that. Of course, we don't all agree on what that is. Right. But... I think most of us would agree that there's something more. Yeah. So that's my whole point. And people, I mean, I never encounter uh, materialists or athe s proposed self-described atheists who don't hold to human value in a way that's curiously supernatural. Yeah. Right? They, they, they don't actually believe that their grandkids are just, you know, accidents who have no purpose, no meaning, mm -hmm. and no absolute value. Right. Right. So that's mm. it's a human it's basically a human de facto position mm. to place onto the material realm something which the actual 
materialist philosophers will say cannot happen. Like Peter right. Singer is a great example. He's an he's an atheist ethicist. I think he's at Princeton right now, but he's he's a well known atheist, mm-hmm. and he argues that he says you know he laments the fact that in the Judeo Christian West we are our ethics are based on Judeo Christian values. Mm-hmm. He says that is heartwarming but illogical. Mm-hmm. And he says, for example, you know, if you have a healthy orangutan who needs a liver transplant, we should probably sacrifice a Down syndrome human uh, because functionally speaking, that, that human will have mouth, will not be a contributor to society. Mm-hmm. So it's it's an act of speciesism to sacrifice the orangutan for a dysfunctional human because there is no hierarchy in value. Mm-hmm. They're both very similar biologically. Mm-hmm. So, so anyhow. But now you're into the... To, Correct. to the life question, what the differences between different kinds of life, not on a supernatural question. Correct. Right. So the, the, I think the question is today, is it illogical to believe that there is more than just nature to existence? Right. And I would say that if that is true, then almost everybody is illogical because mm-hmm. everybody believes there's more. Yep. Right. We disagree on what it is. Most people will not go to their grave or stand on a hill or die on the fight of, I guess it's die on the hill and stand in the fight <laughs> a little backwards, but most people won't do that on like, hey, absolutely no, no supernatural. Mm-hmm. Nobody does that because yep. everybody knows it's not true. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at the prevalence, especially in this part of the world of horoscopes and things like that. I mean, literally, I've had, I've had highly intelligent people refer to their... Uh, some sort of psychic reading they've had or a horoscope they like to read. And again, there's nothing, there's no evidence to back that up, but there is that incredible urge to believe in the supernatural. Mm-hmm. And they don't, they've removed Christianity from part of the buffet, mm-hmm. so they have to reach for something else. So yeah. Yeah. now what's interesting is not only have primitive people, so to speak, clung to a supernatural worldview throughout history, but some of our most of our greatest thinkers have argued rationally for the existence of a what they the Greeks used to call a metaphysical realm yeah. beyond physics. Mm-hmm. And they Plato, for example, argued that it was more real yeah, exactly. than this world. Yeah. The way a bowl of soup is the real source mm-hmm. and the smell of the soup is emanating from it's an epiphenomenon of the soup, which is mm-hmm. the base reality. Mm-hmm. So he said the base reality was metaphysical. We are a simple vapor coming off of our physical experience of everyday life is secondary. It's an yes. emanation of that. Realm. And as Christians, that's exactly what we believe. Mm-hmm. One of the arguments that Plato used was what's called the forms argument. So very simply put, if you take a geometric form like a square, um, the reality is you've never seen a perfect square in your life. Mm-hmm. It doesn't exist in reality. Mm-hmm. You, you know exactly what a square is. You have a blueprint in your mind so that when you see a bad square, like a, when a kid would draw, mm-hmm. you automatically say, that's not a true square. Right. A true square is four points connected by perfectly straight lines for at 90 degree angles between each point. That's a square. Mm-hmm. Now, even if you go on your Word document and you click and drag and create a square, it looks about as good as it gets to the human eye. But if you zoom in on the screen, and I've taken screenshots of this, you see that the pixels are not really actually matched up. There's, right. you know, and you immediately your brain goes, "Well, this is not a perfect square." Mm-hmm. Yet again, how do you know that? Mm-hmm. You've never seen a square in your life. Mm-hmm. No one has, but we all have seen it. We reference a blueprint that exists in another place other than the material realm. Mm-hmm. That was a basic argument. He also used the Plato's cave analogy where he said, look, we're all, people born in this world are simply like people trapped in a cave, l- literally bolted against a, a wall, and they're looking at uh, shadows created by a fire behind them. And right. someone's holding yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I remember that. And he goes, even that's not the total real world because you can crawl out beyond the fire and go above ground out of the cave where the sun, which is the ultimate fire, uh, that is the real reality. Our material existence is kind of like the in the movie The Matrix, when the people are stuck, plugged into the mm-hmm. video game world that they're made to believe is, is real. Mm-hmm. The real world is outside of that. Right, right. So we've had our best an- analytical philosophers throughout history 
prove to us that there is something that exists. Math is another example. Mm -hmm. Where is the number two? Right. It is a concept that we put over the material realm and it works perfect. It works to describe reality perfectly. Mm -hmm. We use it for engineering, medicine, etc. but it is not itself an actual physical thing. Mm -hmm. It is, but it's very real. Sure. Yeah. So as soon as you walk into a math department in a university, you've now X'd out atheism and materialism as the worldview option. Mm -hmm. just from believing in math, pursuing math knowledge, and working with your rational mind to understand mm -hmm. math. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. All of this comes back to also um, the concept of truth. Can we know truth? Is there such a thing as truth? If that's true, then there is something more than physical existence because truth can't be produced by nature. Truth is an, an evaluation of nature. Right. And if if it's a real thing, um, then it has to be something that is metaphysical. That's been our way. And we nobody walks around thinking that two plus two isn't four, uh, at least hopefully not after they get to about grade two, because it's just not true. Two is a real thing and another two is a real thing. And you put them both together and you get another real thing. And that's four. Right. Those are real things. But like you said, they're not part of the physical existence of um, this planet. So yeah, yeah. I, I think the the real question here um, about this is, are there things that everybody experiences that everybody knows is more than just natural selection, right? So this kind of gets into the, the different qualities of life in creation, right? So everybody knows rocks aren't alive. Now they're things, but they don't have life in them. And then you kind of go up from there. You have like one-celled organisms and then simple organisms after that. And then you have proteins and all the chemicals that go together. And then there's certain kinds of life there, but not life like alive, like a creature life. It's, it's a kind of life, kind of like then you get into the plant realm, right? And those things are alive. Of course they are, but they're not alive like your pet dog is, right? And then you get into, you know, insects and orders and orders and orders and as you kind of go up the chain or the, up the tree, the nature of those lives change. And when we get to here where we are, we realize there's more going on here. Because even in our relationships with our closest creatures, the mammals in our world, don't we have some kind of connection? Like we know that you don't just treat animals badly. We have whole organizations in this world about the importance of treating our animals and this planet well that's i think that's real and mm -hmm. it's right yep. we should because we care about um the creation that has been made for us and that level of life is is kind of they share some things with us and one of those things is a spirit kind of like there's more than just because doesn't the bible use a term like nefesh like a Hebrew yeah, like term, rosh and nefesh, and right. all of those wind and spirit things um, applied to animals. Applied to animals as well. God breathed a spirit into the mammals. He also does that to man, but he does more than that with man. Mm. That's the difference. What more does he do? He imprints his image on mankind mm. and gives mankind a responsibility to be his representatives in the physical creation. Yeah. So right. would you say we're qualitatively different than even the highest ordered mammals? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like we sure. have, the Bible's very clear yeah. that man is the culmination of the creative process that he engaged in. It was the end of his work in creation. Creation was created for man, mm -hmm. right? That's what the Bible teaches. Right. We are not some kind of top of the natural selection chain and we're waiting for the next one to come and wipe us out mm -hmm. and dom no man has was given in the bible read it in genesis you are to fill the earth and multiply and subdue it and rule it basically the the command given to adam and eve in the beginning as they were placed in god's garden was now go and turn the rest of this earth into this garden Go dominate the return, turn the earth into Eden. That's what your job mm. is for. And fill it with your offspring. Yeah. Rule the animals. They're there for you. He reiterates all of this stuff um, to Noah. Like the animals creation is for mankind. 
right? That's I know that a lot of people won't like that. Yeah, well, it's definitely countercultural. Like, totally. You're, you're, you're going to offend somebody clear. here, Pastor Dan. <laughs> you're getting offensive here. Yeah. Well, and if I I, it's probably the saying. number, probably the most. I heard this uh, said one time that the most common thread in all worldviews is that something's wrong. Mm-hmm. Right. We call it the doctrine of sin. Yeah. Other people call it, you know, uh, not enough education or equality. Right. If you're if you're more than the left wing of politics, everyone agrees that humanity is not as it should be. Right. And everyone agrees that basically something needs to be done. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the image of God, which only humans have, according to Scripture, Christian mm-hmm. Scripture, mm-hmm. Um, what what would that mean in terms of essentially what that's saying is that there's something in us on a spiritual level. Cause if you look at our brains, uh, biologically speaking, mm-hmm. there isn't a quantum leap, um, in between, let's say our brains and a Neanderthal brain, right? Like matter of fact, the Neanderthal brains were bigger than ours on mm-hmm. average. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've done a full genomic study now on at least three specimens of Neanderthal. And there is no link between us in terms of evolutionary history mm-hmm. that they are actually a separate creature. Mm-hmm. And let's say we take the uh, material, let's say we take the view um, of, of an old earth position just as a, as a thought experiment. Mm-hmm. In about three million years of existence, two, two plus million years of existence, the technological leap that that brain could do was to basically create arrowheads. Mm-hmm. There's no evidence they could make fire. They know they, there's evidence they could use fire if it was naturally created, mm-hmm. but there's no evidence that they could make or control fire. Fire pits and stuff like that are not found to be with the Neanderthals. And they'd also, there's no evidence that they could make clothing or had any sort of ritualistic behavior like we do. Mm-hmm. Contrast that as soon as humans appear in the archeological record, we have symbolic thinking right away. So art, cave paintings, music, Mm -hmm. worship, Mm -hmm. uh, symbolic things like jewelry and currency. Uh, We also went from, you know, immediately we improved on the arrowhead to having fish hooks, uh, sewing needles, Mm -hmm. traps, nets, spears, bows and arrows. Mm -hmm. And within 30,000 years, we have the space station, right? So there's this, uh, to put it one way, there's a quantifiable proof of human exceptionalism. Mm-hmm. which we would say that's because, it, but you can't really look at the brain and say it's because of this massively different brain structure. It's almost identical, as far as we can tell, to that of the Neanderthal. Mm-hmm. That plays into our hand as Christians to say what the, one of the differences is our soul is different. What makes us supernaturally, what makes our minds is different. Yeah, yeah. The, definitely the Bible says that humanity, the, the descendants of Adam and Eve, are different than the rest of creation. Now, that doesn't we, we share commonalities with every other part of creation, including inorganic things, mm-hmm. right? We have carbon in our bodies just like the ground does, right? We share all of the same, I forget how many elements that we would have in our body, and but we share all of that, right? That doesn't necessarily mean much because we because we're creatures. We live in a physical world. Of course, we share some things. And the closer the relationship gets, the the more we share. I mean, even in chimpanzees and the difference between chimpanzees and humans, the DNA is very similar. But when you're talking about DNA, that even a little minute difference is volumes of effect in a creature, Mm -hmm. right? So the closeness of Neanderthal or whatever, I think, I think the real question comes to um, if you want to talk about you know supernatural or a metaphysical reality is um, is there such a thing of, as free will or not mm. that's that's the difference yep. right so if there is nothing more than nature there is no such thing as free will there's no real choice in life or even rational thinking all of it goes out the window because yep. if you think about um an only natural existence, okay, rocks just do what rocks do, right? So they have no initiative of their own, so they fall or move or kick regarding, they just do what they do. That's how, that's their nature. Grass just does what it does. If if the sun shines and it's warm enough, it grows. If the sun's not warm enough and there's snow on top of it, it stops growing and it does like, and the same thing with like insects. Mosquitoes just fly around looking for people to bite. They don't think about it, they just do it. Same thing with, you know, lower forms of life. 
Now, the problem is when you start getting into the higher forms of life and you start seeing evidences of more than just instinct occurring around you. You can start to see that even in your pets, right? When you have a pet dog or a pet cat, how much stuff do we joke about in our lives about the dog wants this and the dog's doing this and the difference between cats? And we, we, we share some things there and we realize that, you know, there's more going on in that relationship, even just between us and our closest relatives in the, in the, in the animal world. How much more then do we then feel it amongst ourselves? Right. Right. That we have real choices. Like you and I are making choices to do this. Right. We are. We have choices to get married. We have choices to what job. We have choices to what to do every day. Are those real or not? Well, because Stephen Hawkins would say no. It appears to be right, free to it will, but but, but it cannot have it be both ways. Right. Well, that's the thing is because from his perspective, and you know, who am I to disagree with Stephen Hawkins? Right. Mm. Um, but what he, because he's adopted a materialist worldview where he literally had to come to the, to the conclusion that if there was no evidence of other universes, then yes, the big bang was from nothing, mm-hmm. which contradicts the most basic views about cause and effect that we right. run every ounce of the scientific method on. Right. And he, of course he has to also say that although it appears that we have free will mm-hmm. and are able to rationally think that is an illusion. Yeah. So at the very least, the materialist has to agree that his viewpoint must be has a burden of proof because yeah. it contradicts our direct experience. Totally, and I, I I'm glad that Stephen Hawking is in, or was intellectually honest in that. Yes, because that is intellectually honest. Because the, if it is if everything is only natural, um, just like grass just does what it does, and mosquitoes just do what they do. It's a wind up toy. And you get more and more complicated yep. things, but in the end, no free lions will. just do what lions do. Yep. And if we get into, if we're going to hold that all the way through, when we get to the human level, no matter how much the complexity of the decisions and the choices and the actions are, in the end, they're only what nature has produced in you. Yep. You didn't actually choose anything; you just did what. Um, instinct and DNA and natural processes dictated you to do just like the lion does when he's chasing the gazelle and just like the the dog does and just like the mosquitoes do and just like the grass it's just a more complicated equation yep that's all yep is that really true do people really nobody believes that we believe we actually have choices well not only that but it scares us to think we're we're robots like I, I was watching uh, years ago, I was watching the old Twilight Zone episodes, the black and white 1960s oh, yeah, Twilight yeah, Zones. Yeah. And in it, this girl is going around doing about her business. She's a regular all-American girl. Mm-hmm. And then there's weird little clues that get dropped throughout the episode that something's not quite right. Right, right. Well, long story short, at the end of the, the climax of the show is the camera zones in on her face as the horror draws across, across her face. She realizes she's not human. Mm-hmm. She's a robot with implanted memories. So the very idea that we're not actual souls with freedom and rational thinking is horrendous. Mm-hmm. It's a horror show. Mm-hmm. And that has to be sold to us in a pretty grim, you know, sleight of hand by materialists and hum- secular humanists. Now, the, the, the real problem with that, that I, if I was a, a materialist, the real linchpin in that is when you realize that, you know, like chain links, like the, the linked chains on a bike chain, right? They just go round and round according to the gear structure. Mm-hmm. There is, n- they don't sit there and think about whether or not they're going to obey physics. Right. They have to. Yeah. So you're thinking, if you're Stephen Hawkins, is not guaranteed to be accurate. It just might be the way you're designed to tick. Mm-hmm. And your entire worldview is now undermined by the fact that you don't you don't actually have a truth-seeking machine. You have a chemical reaction bowl of noodles. That's it. Yeah. And just like, you know, proto prototype, you know, slugs respond, have light sensitive cells in their mm-hmm. eyes, but see no detail, mm-hmm. your brain has no guarantee of latching on to truth. Right. As human beings made in the image of God, we have two things going for us as Christians. We believe that not only do we have something that's not tethered to our neurochemical, you know, wind-up toy, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it is free to move mm-hmm. and to see things from a top-down position, right. including the human brain, by the way, mm-hmm. as we study it. But we also have a brain made like the Creator's, 
It works like the master creator's brain, which is why we can see reality and trust what our brains, ra- we have a basis for rational thinking. Right. Yeah. They don't. Yeah. I, I, that's, I think everybody operates as if there is real choice involved in life. Otherwise, why would we punish people for things that they do, right? If they're not doing anything wrong, right? If they're only doing what they've been programmed to do, isn't it a little unfair to punish the drunk driver or to punish the murderer or the thief? Hence the rehabilitative theory of punishment that's Mm -hmm. crept into our society the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. They're sick. They're not evil. But according to the secular humanists. Right. So I guess what we're doing then is trying to fix their physical body so that they, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's like, it's like if you fix a car and it runs right. Right. So why would you punish the car for having run wrong when it was broken? That's the question. No moral culpability is possible. Right. But we don't actually believe that, right? No. We act like we, every second of our lives internally and externally, we act as if that was not true. Totally. Yeah. Cause you, you can say intellectually, Oh, I, this is what I, but, do you believe that when somebody comes in your house and takes your TV, right? <laughs> oh, oh, it's just what they do. Yeah. Right. No problem. No. no, no, of course not. You're like, Hey, that's wrong. You shouldn't have done that. That was, that was a bad choice. Right. We all, that's well, and more moral culpability is inherent with Christian belief. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's, it, it's impossible without free will and free will is impossible without something non-physical occurring as part of the human experience. Right. And I would argue that moral culpability is intrinsic in life itself. I think every person that's alive has some kind of standard within themselves for morality. I'm not saying it's good or bad or they're all the same, but everybody has this feeling of this is how I should behave, Mm -hmm. right? That has to come from somewhere. If it's real, it has to come from somewhere beyond nature. Nature cannot produce something greater than itself. So if we actually feel a weight of morality or truth or those things, those things by definition must come from outside of natural processes. Yeah. Well, it's like C.S. Lewis said, um, if we just try and base morality on instinct, right? In Mere Christianity, I think it's one of his opening chapters. He mm-hmm. says, you know, because he was, he was around in the beginning of this materialist movement. You know, he saw it coming and saw where it was going. Mm-hmm. And he said, listen, if it's just instinct, then, you know, my instinct at any given time is self-preservation. That would be the strongest instinct. So if I see a person in need, in trouble, and I'm thinking, well, I'm risking my life by saving them. Well, an atheist would say, yeah, we also have a herd instinct Mm -hmm. where we have an instinct to preserve the the, the strength of the herd at our own peril. Mm -hmm. He goes, there's a problem with that, though, because now I'm presented with two notes on the piano, the self-preservation instinct and the herd instinct. And I find that there's a third thing going on. My, for most people, we would all attest to this. And pe- he went to war. He was in World War I. He saw this firsthand. Mm-hmm. The default position for most people is personal safety. Mm-hmm. But what happens in battle, thankfully en- enough, is people use a third instinct, what if you want to call it that, to shift the strength away from the preserv- self-preservation instinct mm-hmm. and force themselves to do the herd instinct. Yes. That third thing is not an instinct. It's a free will decision right. based on following what he said. There's notes, actions, individual actions are like notes on a piano. Mm-hmm. These things that tell us to get away from one instinct and to strengthen another more weak instinct, which mm-hmm. in a natural realm, the weaker instinct should always lose. That other activity is me following the notes on the piano. The, mm-hmm. the piano sheet music mm-hmm. is telling me which notes to play when. Mm-hmm. That itself is not a piano key. This, like we're saying, no individual action, naturally speaking, is the same as that instinct we or that that urge we have. Right. I won't say instinct to do the what should be done, mm-hmm. what ought to be done. Because mm-hmm. if I if I if I draw a bunch of chemicals. Uh, on a, I've, I've done this before and I was teaching a, a kid's class. I drew a bunch of chemicals like oriented like an organic chemistry. And I said, what is the difference between these chemicals on the left and the ones on the right? And all they could say at first was, well, one of them shifted this way. There's a physical shift in the orientation of these chemicals. Mm-hmm. 
I go, now, if I told you that these chemicals is me pushing an old lady into oncoming traffic, if I zoom out enough, you'll notice that this orientation of chemicals is me shoving an old lady in front of a car to get, get her killed. Hmm. Panel B is me as I pull her away because she was starting to walk towards a moving vehicle and I pull her away. Chem- physically speaking, the only differences between the two are orientation and questions of orientation, mm-hmm. distance, mm-hmm. and whatever. Right. What tells you which action is right or wrong, right. physically speaking? Well, of course, the answer is there's no physical cues. There's another cue system that we use, and it's not in the physical realm. Yep. Yeah, I, I totally um, understand what well, you're I saying. Well, I hope you agree sure. because you're a pastor. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, apparently that's what they tell me. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the, the, the question of um, the metaphysical nature of existence has been one that has been constantly asked and answered throughout human history. And the answer just keeps coming back yes. Like there's just no way around that. And, and in an intellectual honesty um, for how life is actually lived on this mm-hmm. planet. Yep. Right. And I think um, one of the things that we all see and all feel, um, we, we feel the, the reality of a greater existence. It's not just us and it's not just this thing. Oh, sorry. Not yep. just this thing that, that I can touch and feel. Um, and the, the, the time that we know that's all true is when we're standing around the grave, mm-hmm. right? And you're burying your spouse or your kid or your parent or whatever, and you're w- looking at that, and you just, everybody knows. It, it's That's not all there is. It's not just ashes to ashes and dust to dust, and we wink into existence, and we wink out, and it's all okay. It is not okay. Um, it, it, there is more going on there, and we all know that at those times. And, but the feeling fades, and we go on, and uh, life's to be lived, and there's cars to be bought, and houses to be cleaned, and jobs to go to, and all of those things, and we forget. And we just kind of move on like everything's fine, um, which brings up the, the big thing in, in human existence is what do we do with death? Right? That's the big question. How do we make sense of death then? If all of this is all nothing purposeful, and there's nothing more, then why do we have such angst about this? Why do we fight so much against it? Why do we fear it so much if it's all so natural? That just it just that yeah. does not make sense at all. And the only thing is, is we ignore it. Yeah. And so when it's forced upon us, we have to think yep. about it. And those are the times when it's very clear inside of us that there is more here. Mm-hmm. Right? And the mo- the most uh, unhappy people uh, are typically. Uh, wealthy, materialistic, secular humanists. They commit suicide at a higher rate Mm -hmm. in the absence of, you know, financial stress, uh, even in full-blown health. Um, You you go to places that value community, spirituality. It it can be in Africa, in tribal Africa. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, you know, the suicide rates are almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. You have to find educated, wealthy materialists to find a high suicide rate. Mm -hmm. It's as though, I mean, Jean-Paul Sartre, right? The existentialist, the French existentialist. Mm -hmm. Um, Jean-Paul Sartre and also Camus, the uh, author of uh, The Stranger. Mm -hmm. Two early century um, materialists. Well, they essentially, on their, a week before he died in a car accident, Camus had actually met and apparently, supposedly was baptized by a French uh, Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. Sartre on his deathbed asked to be given his last rights. Mm-hmm. And um, what's who's the, who's the author of the Dorian Gray uh, book? Oh, I don't remember. Flamboyant gay guy mm-hmm. in a time where it was not acceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, anyways, his name escapes me, but he was a very, very outspoken mm-hmm. um, yeah. materialist if, uh, atheist. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna... Anyways. Yeah, who uh, wrote Dorian Gray? I get the name's on the tip of my tongue. Good thing about having uh, the internet. With that's you right. These things, eh? It's an extension of our brain. Uh, Oscar Wilde. Correct. That's right. Okay. On his deathbed, asked for a priest because he said, "He goes, I've lived, I've lived a life of selfishness and sin, mm-hmm. and only th- again, this is not officially recorded, but this is said to have, have occurred. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need only a God can take away my sin, and yep. he asked to be, uh, he asked to, to see a pastor or a priest 
before his death. Literally, you could write volumes and volumes exactly. of books about that. Uh, lot, that's happened to so many people. It doesn't, that's the funny thing, right? It doesn't matter what everybody does. When the, the end comes, everybody's kind of the same, mm-hmm. right? And so um, we shouldn't get too bent out of shape about our own, um, you know, self-power and self-existence. And in the end, we're all just heading for that box, yep. right? So you better have an answer for it. Hey, totally. Because you're going to test your theory on the other mm-hmm. side. <laughs> yeah, and this right. is uh, – Pascal's wager is something that I find uh, – Pascal believed that there was tons of, of evidence for, he was a Christian, he was a famous scientist first, mm-hmm. um, and then he became a, a Christian uh, at age 32, mm-hmm. died at 39. He spent his last seven years of life doing no scientific work, just theological questioning. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said that even in the absence of the evidence for God's existence, let's say that he believed there was plenty of evidence, I mean, his whole, his theological works were proof of God's existence. Mm-hmm. He goes, but look at it this way. If you're a Christian and you're wrong, right? What's what's the worst case scenario? Mm-hmm. Well, nothing. Mm-hmm. You stop existing, but you've lived a good life, moral life, and then you're well-respected, typically live a good moral life, and then you go to the same place everybody else goes, which is nowhere. Mm-hmm. Best case scenario, you have the maximum joy for the maximum period of time. There is zero downside, and there is infinite upside. Yep. Flip that around. If you're an atheist and you're wrong, mm-hmm. you got a maximum, maximally negative outcome mm-hmm. for the maximum amount. You've an infinite downside. <laughs> yeah. Your best case scenario is a zero value, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Now, again, the whole series we're going to be doing here is about rational reasons that why we believe Christianity is the correct worldview. Yeah. And we're just starting today with the supernatural realm. Right. And yeah, before, before we're done, I wanted to touch on one of the major points I, I, I wrote down on my notes that we never got to is most of my friends, I went through this through a scientific educational process. And so I was surrounded by the modern secular scientific university student and teacher mm-hmm. uh, system. And back in the day, you know, before we had functional MRIs and highly scientific recording equipment for right. brain activity, mm-hmm. we didn't really have a understanding that thought life is connected to our physical body the way we do now. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I hook you up to a bunch of machines, every time your brain does anything, uh, thinking about dinner, doing a a simple math equation in your brain, there'll be a physical event triggered in your brain. Mm -hmm. So there's a one-to-one connection between I think and my brain does something. And that's used to point to, that's used as fuel for this materialist worldview of the human soul to say we don't need, a soul is a, you don't need to in- invoke the human soul. Mm-hmm. There's the brain working. Like your liver does what it does. Your mm-hmm. brain does the thinking. Yeah. So what's an interesting point to, to make here is there's an there's a philosophical thought experiment that you can apply to anything. And it's actually a logical law. And it's called the law of identity. And very simply put, it says if there's two things you're trying to figure out if they're the same thing, you have to look at it carefully and if there's anything true of, let's say, A, that is not true of B, then by definition, they're not the same yes, thing. Totally. So my question is, is there any difference between thought life and physical brain activity? Right. And if there is, automatically, we cannot have a materialist worldview. Right. Something's happening in here. And from the Christian perspective... This is the area where the soul and the body intersect. Mm-hmm. This is where the sacred and the, and the non-sacred meet, mm-hmm. so to speak. Mm-hmm. So well, if you're doing a, a sleep study, for example, right, they'll hook you up to machines, they'll, they'll watch your brain with a functional MRI machine, and then you wake up and they'll say, well, what did you dream about, right? Mm-hmm. If they're recording my brain, and let's say I fast forward to, we bring equipment from the future back to here. Let's say... 10,000 years in the future. I don't think the world's going to last that long, but let's say 10,000 years of of scientific development. We put those guys in a time machine. We bring them back here and they just blow us away. Their their recording equipment makes our MRI machines look like an Etch-A-Sketch, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And they, I'm talking every chemical that fires in your brain is recorded by their machinery so that when I'm thinking, every physical event that is happening in my cranium is recorded and known. Right. 
is there something that will not be picked up? Mm. What would that be? Right, right. The content of the thought the itself. Thought, yeah, you never know. The only way to build a catalog between this thought elicits this brain activity is you have to bypass the physical system and go right to the conscious person and say, what were you just thinking of? Yeah. And then you can relay the two because they are not the same. If all our thinking was only physical, then all you would have to look at is the physical brain to determine what I'm thinking. Right. That is not possible. Right. Con so that what's happening between the brain and the soul, basically, the reason they're linked one to one in brain events is it's kind of like the puppet master holding the marionette strings to a puppet, mm -hmm. right? When his hand moves, the puppet's hand moves. That is our relationship with our brain. Mm -hmm. And we've proven it with this simple thought experiment. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't equate thoughts with brain activity because we, we, we believe in science. We believe in medicine, all of those things. Like, so brain activities are real. It's how your brain controls your body. That does not equate to your thought life, though, because your thought life is more than just your brain controlling your body, right? Your thought life has to do with your existence and the past and the future and your relationships and all of those things way more than the physical. And you're, you can't, I don't think you can intellectually honestly say that desires and intentions and emotions are purely based on natural physical processes. I don't think that's true. And I think most people would say that they don't think that's true either. Mm -hmm. There is a, th a real thing that is a thought life of a person that is beyond physical existence. That's what I think yeah. everybody would believe that. And your experiment proves that, right? Yeah. You, you can't, you can't tell thoughts by looking at brain activity. Yeah. We have the advantage as Christians in invoking every bit of true scientific knowledge that exists because it's obviously what's what's real is real. Mm -hmm. But a materialist or an atheistic view of the world runs into some serious evidentiary problems. Yeah. Like and how illogical you, that? you you can't. All right. And there are spiritual things that can affect people. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. I think everybody kind of feels that or yep. otherwise why do we have multi-billion dollar self-help groups and psychologists and psychiatrists everybody feels like there's something that i can't just take a pill for mm -hmm. there's something i have to sort out right. in here right why is that true or not if, are we just walking around pretending that that's true i, I think it's yeah. true and i think the bible uh, speaks to that and i think people's experience speak to the reality of that there is a spiritual existence to creation yeah. Not just physical. Well, the the head of the head of the psychi psycholo American Psychological Association, I think, in the eighties, he 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 eventually committed suicide, but he had he had overseen the transition in the field of psychology uh, from calling things sin or or moral failures mm -hmm. to calling things sickness. Yeah. And he lamented at the end of his career. He said, "By divorcing human behavior from sin or evil." we have ushered in a realm of meaninglessness and pur purposelessness. And he felt that it, they had gone the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, at the end of his, of his life, he ended up committing suicide, which yeah. does tend to happen. Now, what about near death experiences? Have you had people in as a pastor who've, yeah, a lot of people uh, talk about that. I've never been at one. I've never had one myself. Right. Um, but I, th I think that's um, definitely a real phenomenon mm -hmm. that, people either under great physical duress or strain um, even you know some kind of suppression of life signs in their body wake up again and they have something that happened that is beyond what happened on the table for sure mm -hmm. right they're lying there dead or yeah. whatever not breathing little brain activity if any heart's not beating for a few minutes and then they wake up again and they say i had this experience mm. i don't doubt that they think that they had that experience yeah. i don't i don't know what what or why yep but they for sure believe it well gary habermas i, I forget the name of the book but he did he, he compiled in this day and age we have like trauma helicopters we have ambulances more and more people, and we have these very high-tech medical uh, techniques. Yeah. 
So more and more people in our day and age are going further and further down the biological death spectrum mm -hmm. and being brought back. Right. And he found that he did a series of, of interviews with uh, surgeons and ER physicians. Mm -hmm. And he says it's interesting because these people are not selling their story. There's no financial interest. Right. But he compiled in his book the most stunning examples of near-death experiences. And probably the most stark one in the book is this uh, young girl. I think she was 11 or 12. She'd been submerged underwater for almost 20 minutes. When mm -hmm. they brought her in, she didn't. her pupils didn't even react to light, mm -hmm. which means only part of your brainstem is active. The mm -hmm. rest of your brain is on the dimmer switch way down low. You can't hear, you can't see, you can't do anything. Well, her family was with her for a few hours. Finally, the, the doctors and nurses sent the family home for a, for a break. They go, basically, your daughter's never going to be normal again. Mm -hmm. She'll be brain dead at best, mm -hmm. probably dead sooner than later. Go take a, go take a break. Mm -hmm. So the family goes home. In the middle of the night, she spontaneously recovers. She starts to describe people that had been on shift before she woke up, mm -hmm. that had gone home since then. Mm -hmm. She then explains that she went home and saw her family. And that she could, she explained what was on the radio, mm -hmm. uh, what her dad was saying in one room, the board game her brothers were playing, and what her mother was cooking. Mm -hmm. And before they, they, they quickly intercepted the parents when they came back to see her, and they said, "We just need, you know, is this correct?" And they, they validated that. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, I was reading. Uh, it was an online newspaper in Ca the Cowichan River. I think it's the Cowichan River. Every year, someone drowns tubing down that stupid thing. Mm. This one guy had drowned, and this was in the article itself. And he said that while he was being resuscitated, he was watching from the from about 15 feet above a bird's eye view position. Mm -hmm. And that's what's fairly common with these uh, cases is it takes the person a while to realize they're looking at themselves, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> but he survived. Weird. He was brought back. He was reanimated, yeah. and he had this story. Mm -hmm. One of my patients uh, was involved in a serious car accident, actually broke his spine. Mm -hmm. And he described being shot straight through about a hundred feet in the air and slowly coming back into his body from there. He saw the first responders show up, etc. Mm -hmm. And when he got to the ER, he told this story to his, to the ER physician mm -hmm. and nonchalantly, the ER physician says, okay, hold on. And he brings in a bunch of residency students and he goes, you guys are going to hear a lot of these stories in your career. Here's your first one. Mm -hmm. So this ER it was talking like it's pretty routine to hear mm -hmm. of legitimate experiences like that mm -hmm. now if there is no such thing as the supernatural there's no such thing as a human soul that's separate right. from the physical so body how do you explain that you got a lot of problems <laughs> right. evidentially mm -hmm. as an atheist yeah and as a christian i have no problem with that zero we right. believe in the physical right all of it now i would quite, you know kind of put this caveat in there's a big difference between a near-death experience and a death experience, yep. <laughs> right? So um, I can handle some kind of weird stuff going on with near death. Of course, it's it's very traumatic. There's brain. Their brain is a complex organ mm -hmm. as well, and we are also more than physical. We are spiritual beings. I I okay, fine. There's some weird stuff. If you drown and come back to life after come back to life after ten minutes, okay, that's a very unusual. 99.99 add on a hundred more nines to that of people have no near-death experience 100% yep. of people have a death experience yep. though and so we can't just we can't read too much into what happens in a near-death experience right. as something that tells us what a death experience Correct. is that's the only caveat I would absolutely get. but the reality of the existence of near-death experiences I have no problem I don't think anybody no. would have a problem based on the bible with that for no sure. gosh no Nope. And I mean, the, the reality is um, Christianity is kind of like a medical practice, the way I, I see it, where we're trying to decipher what is real and how best to operate based on what is real. So mm -hmm. the ultimate question any human being has to ask themselves is, I'm going to spend most of history dead, mm -hmm. right? Am I prepared for death? Mm -hmm. And if the, if, if the majority of the idea. evidence supports life beyond death, that our conscious souls have nothing to do with the health or, or the health standard of our body. Right. And that I think most, I don't know, I'll know sooner or later, but I think a lot of people who die, it's kind of like people who've had, you know, believable um, near death experiences. Your consciousness just streams right along into whatever's next. Mm -hmm. And people will be surprised at it's just an instantaneous trip on the other side mm -hmm. 
And the whole business of Christianity is making sure we're ready mm -hmm. to, to do well right. with what comes after, to do well while we live and to be safe when we're somewhere else. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, if we, we keep going on this and, and pull up more discussions on, on these kinds of things, we can get into that. I think what we maybe should do, because we're probably getting a little yep. short on time here, um, let me just tell you the, the picture that the Bible paints of this relationship, okay? Um, so we, we have to always start at the beginning, in the, in the beginning, God, right? So God, the Bible says, is a spiritual being. Now, careful with that because God is also transcendent beyond space and time, right? So he exists outside of the created world, the created universe, right? That's um, one option for how we think this all got here. Another one would be the Big Bang Theory. It all came from nothing for no reason. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that there is a God who exists outside of space and time, and he is um, spirit, not this. This hasn't been made. This is made by him. It does, it's not him. Right? God is not everything. God is ubiquitous, but he is not everything. He exists outside of the creation. That's kind of like the whole um, panentheism is that. Right? Mm -hmm. Panentheism yep. is that God is everything. Mm -hmm. Right? No, we wouldn't believe that. We would believe in the omnipresence of God, that God yep. is God is everywhere. There's nothing he's... nothing. Only even that means it's just... He's aware of everything and nothing is beyond his reach is the idea of omnipresence, right? You can't get anything by God. Um, anyway, God exists in unapproachable light is the idea that the Bible gives. We can't ever see God because he doesn't exist in a way that we can see him. He exists beyond our uh, ability. Um, but then what God does is he makes a creation, and the first thing he creates is a spiritual realm of beings. And the Bible says that that spiritual realm and those beings number in the at least millions, if not hundreds and maybe even billions. So the Bible very clearly affirms the existence of not just a spiritual realm, but myriads of spiritual beings that exist that have been made by God. Now, in that spiritual realm, God then manifests his own presence in that realm. So it's not God, the eternal transcendent being that exists in that realm. He manifests his presence into that realm. And the Bible, is a, it's a little harder to get this out of the Bible, but it's there. Um, multiple passages in the Old Testament that reference the angel of the Lord. That, that, that's God's manifestation in the spiritual realm, okay? He exists as a spiritual being in the spiritual realm because he has chosen to do that. He is the... Um, the Bible uses the word Elohim to describe these beings. They're Elohim. It just means spiritual being. Bible translated translates its gods with little g sometimes. So Yahweh, the creator of all, exists as an Elohim in the Elohim's realm. So he is an Elohim. He is a spiritual being existing in the spiritual realm. He um, he is not though. <laughs> sorry, Elohim are not God. God is an Elohim. Yahweh is an Elohim, but there's only one Yahweh. There are other Elohim. So that's the idea in the Bible gives, gives that there is a spiritual creation that exists and is real and has a hierarchy and a structure and beings much kind of like we do, right? We have a complicated relationship with each other and with, with creation, and it is no different in the spiritual realm. Hmm. Now, what the Bible says then, though, God in his spiritual manifestation in the spiritual realm declares to that realm, I'm making a new realm now. I am going to make this thing called space, time, and matter. And it's going to be a new kind of life. It's going to be a new kind of existence. And what we're going to do is we're going to fuse the physical realm, or sorry, the spiritual realm with this new creation that I'm making of the physical realm. And we're going to take spiritual reality and fuse it into physical reality. And the point where we're going to do that is in this creature that I'm going to make called man. 
and God creates a physical being and fuses a spiritual reality into that physical being. That's what you and I are. So another way to say person in the Bible is soul, which is a reference to the spiritual life that has been infused into physical life. Right? So it doesn't do, do away with it. doesn't make it any less. It's not, it's not less valuable to God. It's just different. We are a different kind of being than just a spiritual being. So there's spiritual beings that are purely spiritual, but can affect and interact with the physical creation. And then there are actual beings like Rep, like God is a being. That's why it's important. We're in the image of God, that God is created to exist like him, except physically as well as spiritually. Okay, so that's kind of what the Bible says about how we get to here. The, and then the thing that the Bible says that maybe not everybody would agree with is that um, death is not how this is supposed to work. Mm. So when God put this, these, when God put spirit into creation and when he put soul and body together in man, it was never supposed to come apart, right? It's, we are not soul and body we are both of those things 100 they don't we're not half this and half that we are one thing and the tragedy of death is something that was never supposed to come apart has been ripped apart in our creation mm. and it's not supposed to be that way and that's why it feels so painful and it's so weird here because it, it's, it's not how it's supposed to be mm. in death right you're never supposed to come apart god has made you he loves you why would he do that and the thing about us is we got to remember that we are not just physical existence and we should not have to be separated from our spiritual existence. And one day, the Bible says, God is going to change this all back to where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And this won't happen anymore. There'll still be people. I believe, I think there'll still be, God, that's the thing, God never loses. And what did he say in the beginning? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And we're going to. And that's going to happen one day and death will no longer be a part of it anymore because that's not supposed to be the way it is. Mm. So that's kind of how we get the relation. There's yeah. no, you can't separate human beings into soul and body or spirit and body. And again, in the Bible, when you hear these things about body, soul, spirit, mind, strength, spirit, soul, all of the different combinations of all of those words the idea is the totality of hum of your being, right? When, when the writer says, um, you know, love God with all your heart and soul and mind, and somebody else says, well, love God with your heart, soul, mind, strength, and spirit, are they trying to say two different things? No, they're not. They're trying to say the same thing. They're just right. using a bit different Everything language. that is you. At, it, that's what it means. Just everything that's you, Yep. right? And the Bible's always clear that it, you are more than just a physical existence. Yeah. So in a sense, our worldview is it makes sense of every, every desire and deep need psychologically and spiritually people have. Yeah. And we even have an answer to fix the number one problem we have, which is sin and death. The number one problem is why do we come apart? That's the thing. That's not the way it's supposed to be and yeah. we all feel that right yeah. everybody knows that that is a tragedy mm. when that happens no matter how old you are your mom is 101 years old and lived the great life and you think it's all going to be good but you get to that funeral man that's not okay mm -hmm. right because it's not yeah and god will fix it one day yeah so well i can't think of a better place to to wrap it up <laughs> okay, thank good. you pastor dan and i'm e-man and until the next episode we'll see you guys later okay bye-bye <laughs> Yeah!